almost afternoon, everybody. We'll get started here promptly in about a minute or so. I'll wait for more folks to just come on in. And Francisco, you can still see my screen, correct? Correct. Yes, I do. Another minute or so. We'll start promptly at noon Eastern here, which is about less than a minute. Everyone's having a great day so far on this nice Tuesday in April. Is it the last Tuesday of April? I think it is. It is. I have my March calendar still up. I'm a month behind here. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, I have noon um, Eastern time by my, my watch slash phone. So we'll get started. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for spending some time with us here this afternoon uh, as we are going to discuss some of the top Florida tree and palm healthcare issues uh, and their management strategies. So that's what we're going to talk about here today. Um, a quick safety brief, though, is, of course, check your surroundings for any trip hazards, any other hazards that might be going on. Um, do be aware of any inclement weather that may be coming, and please do have a plan uh, around, uh, around that. And if you are in your vehicle, please be parked in a safe location. And if you're listening and in your vehicle, just be cognizant of the roadways and things like that. Um, safe driving is, is paramount here. Uh, quick introductions before we dig in today, today. So I am Patrick Anderson. I am the Director of Research and our Arborologist here at Rainbow Ecoscience. Um, I work to provide protocol training for our clients throughout the entire country. Um, so we make sure the arborologists, the horticultural specialists, make sure that um, you are using products and protocols correctly. We help with diagnosis. We help with recommendations of tree and shrub care issues going on in the landscape. Um, I also work on our product and equipment support team, as well as our research and development team, um, as probably is evident from my title. Um, my background is I've been in the industry for over um, 20 years. Uh, I am an ISA board certified master arborist and municipal specialist. I am an ISA tree risk assessment uh, qualified arborist. Uh, I'm also an ASCA registered consulting arborist. And um, I have a, a bachelor's degree in forest science from Penn State University. And I'll allow Francisco to introduce himself here. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, good morning. My name is Francisco Cecilia. I'm uh, actually located on uh, south uh, west southeast Florida, or on the area of Fort Pierce. So it was kind of quite deciding whether I wanted to go south or north on that, but I'm more on the south. Uh, so um, my my background is on landscape maintenance uh, for over 20 years, and so have been working on the south uh, east Florida market for for that long of a time. Uh, time flies. So my degree, I have a degree on agronomy from Samorano University and a bachelor degree in agribusiness from Louisiana State. Uh, how do I serve you? I provide education on insect and disease management, plant management, plant growth regulators, and weed control protocols um, that, through training for your teams uh, on how to integrate those protocols uh, on your businesses. Right Thank on. You, Thank you very much. Francisco. And a little bit more about who Rainbow Ecoscience is and why we're even having webinars and why you're here today is that we specialize specifically in providing products and protocols for trees, ornamentals, and landscapes, specifically in landscape maintenance and arboriculture. That's where our specialization is. So that's what we do. Uh, we create new uses for active ingredients. There are other uh, parts of the green industry, like agriculture and nurseries, and we bring them to the landscape by um, researching rates, new formulations, working with the EA, EPA to uh, get labels that make sense for us, uh, and then creating new packaging and formulation. So that's what we do. That's our niche in the industry of Rainbow. And like I said, our, our, our specialty is with trees, shrubs, ornamentals, and landscapes. That's where, that's where we do all of our work. Um, 
a little bit of our history is we were actually founded back in 1976 up uh, outside of Minneapolis, Minnesota in the Twin Cities area of Minneapolis as a response to Dutch elm disease. So Dutch elm disease was a devastating disease, still is a devastating disease of elm trees. Um, when it came to the um, Minnesota area, uh, many elm trees started dying. So that's where our founder uh, found his passion was saving trees. And so that has blossomed now all these years later into a full care tree service company uh, in that part of the country. And now the product development and training side, uh, Rainbow Ecoscience, who um, is what Francisco and I work for. And so just as an example, again, we do a lot of different research and development work. Uh, as an example, we did over 140 field trials in 2022 alone. Uh, Francisco and myself are part of many of those. And we partner with a lot of different uh, partner research institutions and cooperators. You can see just a few of those there. Um, and what we realize is that real world research in developed landscapes is the way to get these predictable results with our products. And at this point here, we've developed several products, including insecticides, fungicides, antibiotics, and plant growth regulators. And we will talk about many of those today. But before again, we get into the content, some housekeeping. So one is um, we encourage uh, questions during the webinar today. If you come up with a question that you want answered, please put that into the question and answer box. You'll see that there. Uh, there's three options there. There's a the chat function, there's a the raise hand function, and the Q&A function. If you want a question answered, please put that into the Q&A box. Um, you can use the chat to banter back and forth if you wish, but we lose things in the chat. So if you want that question answered, please put that into the Q&A box. Um, this webinar is being recorded and the link will come out shortly after. Uh, you can also find this on our website as well as our YouTube page at the conclusion of the webinar today. Uh, give us a few days to get that out there. And then finally, this webinar is worth one ISA CEU. So if you do have an ISA certification, um, you can uh, get an ISA CEU for this. If you did not put in your ISA number when you registered, you can put that number in now, again, in the question and answer box. So if you did put in your CEU number uh, when you registered, no need to do it now. We have that captured. But if you did not, please put that into the Q&A box now. And again, not in the chat, in the Q&A. Things get lost in the chat. We'll find it in the Q&A. With that being said, let's dig into our, our content today. So our agenda, what we'll be covering over are, one, we're just gonna do a really quick uh, review of the appropriate response process. Um, then we're gonna dig into our, it's gonna be a picture show. Uh, we're gonna talk about common diseases and their treatment in Florida. We're gonna talk about some common insect pests and their treatment in Florida. This is gonna be more tailored to um, you know, broadleaf trees and some of our conifers. And then Francisco is going to take us home discussing uh, common palm protocols in Florida. Now, again, we use this word common a lot. Florida, you guys, an amazing state, a lot of different uh, plants, a lot of different pests. So common in Florida, common in one part of the country might mean two or three things. For Florida, it's a lot. So we're going to be doing what they call like just hitting the wave tops on some of these pests. So if you want to learn more about what we're discussing here today, or if we discuss something today, or we or we don't discuss something here today that you were hoping for, please feel free to reach out to Francisco, myself, or our territory managers down there in Florida, and we'll be more than happy to talk about these things all day with you. But real quick, we focus in on the toolbox approach to plant health care, tree and shrub management. So what that means is going through this idea of the appropriate response process, which to sum it up really quickly is we come across some type of plant damaging sign, some kind of plant damaging symptom or an event that's happened out on that landscape. And that ties us into going through this process of understanding what is important to the client, what's important to that landscape manager, assessing the plant, understanding what it is, what stage of its life uh, it, is, it is in, uh, assessing its health, things of that nature, and then assessing what that stressor is. You know, is it a disease? Is it a pest? What is the severity of that disease or pest? And what would happen if that is not treated? Then we go into this um, idea of, you know, is it time to intervene? And a lot of times, and what we're going to be talking about today, our intervention is going to be something like applying a product to that and then evaluating how that process actually went. So we have to always keep this as an underlying kind of thought when we're making these recommendations. Now, again, of course, today we're going to be focusing in on treatment, but our treatments can come in many different ways. 
It could be a cultural treatment, right? It could be like decompaction of the soil, taking a soil sample, doing prescription fertilization. It could be spraying of our product, right? And when we talk about foliar diseases, as we stand here today, foliar applications are probably going to give us the most predictable results. But when we look at some of these other things, specifically some of these arthropod pests, um, soil applications of a product might be appropriate. Trunk injections of a product may be appropriate. So when we talk about the plant healthcare toolbox, we want to make sure that we have all of our options on the table so we can pick the right tool for the pest, the tree, the site, and finally, what our client's expectations are. And so always keep that in the back of our minds as we're going through this. So with that being said, let's talk about just some common diseases. And we're going to break these down into like two or three different areas. But when we talk about disease management, there's a few things we always have to consider. And so, so we're not saying this for every disease we cover, we're just going to say it now, right? So general notes on disease management. One is with diseases, treatments will always work best when applied as a preventative. And we'll talk about how we can predict some of these things here in just a moment. The other point is removing the inoculum. That would be pruning out disease branches, removing fallen leaves where that disease may reside uh, for a period of time. That is always going to be part of our management strategy. So we always have to think of that when we talk about this toolbox approach or an integrated approach to managing the diseases. These are always part of that approach. And then finally, the two last two are, are fairly obvious. Healthy plants will be less susceptible to disease and healthy plants will be less affected should they contract a disease, right? So those are some of the underlying things that we need to be thinking of when we go out and begin treating for plant diseases. The one other thing that's really important to, to kind of get a foundation around when we talk about disease is that disease is the interaction between a susceptible host. And in this case here, we have Albuquerque viburnum, a pathogen. In this case here, we're looking at um, the spores of downy mildew. And then finally, the, the time or the conducive environment, in this case here, we have a very foggy morning, a conducive time and a conducive environment where these two things are interacting. And when we have these three things in the perfect proportions, that's when we have a disease. And in this case here, we see the symptoms of downy mildew causing damage on these Aobuki viburnums. Now, why this is important to note is because if we can break up any part of this disease triangle, if we can change or modify the host, which often isn't practical for us, right? Because we inherit properties that have susceptible hosts. If we can change or modify the environment, that will break up the disease cycle. Again, that might be difficult because again, it's hard to, it's hard to blow away fog on a morning, right? If fog is there, fog is there. However, if we can change or modify the pathogen, maybe do from applying some type of a product to the host, then we will not get disease. And so that's important to note when we talk about this disease triangle. So if we look at first at foliar diseases, there are two really common foliar diseases that we find throughout Florida and on a lot of plants. And these would be anthracnose and cercospora. Anthracnose is this kind of lazy term. Uh, anthracnose describes several genera and species of leaf disease fungi that all behave in the same way. So they affect the plant in the same conducive environment and they all cause the same kind of symptoms and damage. And those symptoms and damage um, are shown really well here. If you look at, this is uh, an excerpt from a paper about uh, anthracnose on mangoes. And if you look at these photos, A, B, and C, this is a real good description of how this disease affects the plant. It begins as these kind of isolated, tan to brownish angular leaf spots uh, with these kind of halos around them that eventually over time coalesce to cause more and more damage and eventually can affect the whole leaf and then the plant will abort the leaf. And most of the time, these types of leaf diseases, very similar to cirrospora. Here we see the cirrospora leaf spot here on ligustrum, which is a common host for it. Most of the times these are aesthetic diseases, meaning that they cause a few leaf spots, they don't cause too much damage. However, in severe infestations or repeated infestations where you see these plants begin to defoliate time and time again, this can begin to cause an added stress on the plant, then then can lead to other problems and eventually the decline of the plant. So most of the time, these aren't really a big deal. They're really just aesthetic, but they can cause health issues down the line. Now, how do we manage for these? So again, going back to that disease triangle, we need a susceptible host, we need a conducive environment. 
a mature leaf, a mature leaf that is completely uh, expanded with a thick waxy cuticle is going to be very resistant to these plant diseases. So when we talk about treatment, we're talking about treating new developing uh, leaves. So that new developing leaf, that is really susceptible to that disease. That's what we call susceptible host. Conducive environment in Florida, in most parts of Florida, we're talking about like late fall, winter, early spring, when plants are still growing, but that growth is slowed substantially. So that leaf takes a long time to develop. So when we have mild temperatures with free water on the plant, what we can get is we get this great conducive environment for disease. So when we talk about foliar sprays, we need to spray that plant as new leaves are expanding during these conducive environments. As the, we need to spray again, as the plant leaf is growing, because as the leaf is growing, it's more area that is not protected by a fungicide. And thus, as these disease spores land, it provides area for that disease to, to set in. So once that plant has, in most cases, fully developed, a fully developed leaf on that new plant, it's going to be less susceptible to disease, and we can stop spraying if we need to. However, if conditions remain conducive, we might need to continue to spray. And again, in Florida, this often happens in kind of like late fall through early spring in the winter when it's more mild, we have a lot of free water, we have some more misty conditions, we have foggy conditions that allow that conducive environment to uh, be prevalent for long periods of time as leaves are slowly growing. There are a lot of different fungicides that work really, really well. I have an example of some of these here. The first one I have highlighted here is Myclotex. This is one of our products. The active ingredient is Myclobutanol. The nice thing about Myclotex is that one, it works really well in a lot of our foliar fungal diseases, the ones we just showed specifically, but it also is labeled for like backyard fruit trees, several backyard fruit trees, which again, in Florida, a lot of customers will have um, different types of fruit trees in their backyard. So this is a nice product that works really, really well um, and is labeled for a large um, host range of um, plants. The next disease we're going to discuss here is downy mildew. So downy mildew, we kind of just looked at this disease triangle. This behaves very much like those first set of foliar diseases that we found. But the key distinction here with downy mildew is that downy mildew is actually not a true fungus. It's an omycete. And so because of that, we have to look at different products. Traditional fungicides that we looked at in our first slide there are ineffective on um, oomycete diseases. So this is just when we talk about diagnosis, making sure we're diagnosing the disease correctly so that we're using the right product palette to manage those diseases. And this is just an example here of some foliar, in this case, uh, fungicides that work on oomycetes that would control that downy mildew disease. So it's important to do diagnosis on these things. The last disease that we're going to cover before we segue over into insects are, is ceridium canker. Now, of note, most of our canker diseases, the vast majority of our canker diseases, are indeed stress-induced diseases. So it is some type of stress that is causing the plant to become susceptible to this disease. Um, things like Leyland cypress and Italian cypress, these become very susceptible to ceridium canker because they're planted in conditions that begin to cause stress on them. Again, Italian cypress um, wants to be growing in a Mediterranean uh, environment, dry environment, right? Not a very hot and humid and wet environment like Florida is. This is common symptoms here when you start seeing several branches starting to brown out all the way. This is what we're seeing here. Um, another characteristic of this disease is they have these elongate cankers, so the canker goes kind of width uh, parallel to the branch. And then finally, if you got out a hand lens, you could see these black spores in there as well, along with those weeping. Now, again, this is a stress-induced disease, so cultural management is going to be super important here. Correct planning, correct irrigation, things of that nature, airflow, that's all going to be important. Well, we know that using plant growth regulators, we can actually induce drought and disease resistance in plants. So using things like Cambostat, which the active ingredient is Paclobutrazole, we can actually induce resistance in plants. It's not a treatment for the disease. It's a way to induce resistance into the plants to make them so that they can withstand some of these diseases uh, and, again, survive a little bit better in these harsh environments we plant them in. 
This is just some data from another canker disease of a canker disease that also affects stress plants in the upper Midwest. And what we're seeing here in this table is we're seeing untreated plants and we're seeing the disease severity rating. And we're looking at our treated plants with paclobutrazole, again, the active ingredient in canvastat. And we can see that we have a reduced um, severity of canker diseases, stress-induced canker diseases when we apply a plant growth regulator. So with that being said, let's segue over here into some of our insect pests. So insect pests can be broken into several different feeding gills and feeding gills describe how they feed. So we have piercing and sucking insects, chewing insects, stem and twig boring insects and leaf mining insects. We're gonna focus in really on these first two because those are some of the ones that we commonly run into in Florida landscapes. So the first one being our piercing and sucking insects. So our piercing and sucking insects are just that. They have mouth parts that penetrate into the plant. And in this case, you're looking at firebug piercing into the buds of a uh, hibiscus. Piercing and sucking insects can cause damage by either one, um, sucking sap directly from the vascular system or puncturing plant cells and feeding on cell contents. One of the most common piercing and sucking insects that we run into uh, throughout the country, let alone in Florida, are scale insects. So scale insects are interesting. They can both be soft scale insects that pierce and suck in the vascular system, or they can be armored scale insects that pierce and actually bust cells and feed in cell contents. They're unique in that most of the time they remain sandy, they don't move. So most of the time uh, they are settled instars or adults that don't move. They just settle and pick and suck at that plant. They over there, at there they hatch from their eggs, they become this crawling, this first instar. And this is what is the most susceptible to our treatments when we start talking about treatments for scale insects. And this here is just a, a video of um, some soft scale insects crawling around looking for a place to feed. So they crawl, they find a place they like to feed, they settle down, they lose their antenna and legs, they plug into the plant and they just begin feeding until they eventually mature. As I mentioned, there's two groups, major groups of in scale insects that we deal with, the armored scales and the soft scales. So the armored scales, again, they're feeding in cell contents. So they're busting cells and feeding on those contents. These can maybe considered more damaging because it takes a lot more energy for the plant to re repair cells that are damaged versus sucking away um, the sap produced from the leaves. This is common here when we start seeing these insects that are feeding on the leaves is coalescing of uh, these uh, chlorotic specks that can eventually cause the plant to defoliate. This is another surefire symptom of these uh, insects where you see all these plants are leafing out except for this one. This one plant hasn't seen the leaf out yet. What's going on here? And if we get closer, all these black things here, these are um, scale insects that are feeding on the cells of that plant. So again, reducing the vitality and the health of the plant. And again, over time, this can become a severe stress, allowing for other things to move in and do a lot more damage, different diseases and other insects to move in and do damage on the plant. Two of our major armored scale insects that we deal with in Florida, ones that can be um, cause a lot of damage and or be fatal, um, one would be phantasma scale. So this is relatively new, first discovered in 2018 and, and slowly moving across the Southern counties of Florida. Uh, this affects a whole host range of um, different plant species. You can see just a few of them that we've listed here, a lot of different palm species. Um, this causes a lot of different damage to. And again, all life phases can be present throughout the entire growing season here. The other one that we deal with that can kill trees is cycad scale. So cycad scale, uh, again, affects both uh, king and queen cycads. And this can be a major pest. This can, if left unchecked, this can kill side cats. So this can be a major pest, an armored scale pest for us down in Florida. The other group of insects that we, or scale insects that we deal with here are soft scale insects. So soft scale insects are um, different from armored scale insects in as much as they are feeding in that vascular bundle. So they are feeding on that photosynthate in the sap that is created there in the leaves. And so this is how they do their feeding. Now, these are a little easier to spot because anything that they can't take up, anything they don't digest in that vascular bundle comes out of the rear ends as uh, honeydew. So if you walk up to a plant and you see a lot of honeydew 
And then Sooty Mole will then grow on that honeymoon dew. That's a surefire sign that you're dealing with a piercing and sucking insect that could be a soft scale. We have some other things as well as aphids and white flies that also feed very similar to this and create these similar symptoms. So if we look at just some really common insects, looking at some soft scale insects, uh, one that's really common is hemispherical scale, also called like brown soft scale. Uh, we find this throughout Florida on a lot of different plant species. Um, and again, pretty characteristic, as you can see that oval, brownish, tannish adult right there. One that we find very often as well that can be really devastating, especially what I find on Pittosporum, is this cottony cushion scale. Again, these um, mature females are pretty large. They're pretty big scale. It's hard to miss them. Create copious amounts of honeydew and cause a lot of damage to Pittosporum. And then the last soft scale that we're going to look at here is this lobate lock scale. Again, a large host range. Um, this can be deadly to wild tamarind out there in South Florida specifically. So it can cause a lot of damage to a lot of different plants. Wax myrtle is one I find it on very often. And again, can also be deadly to this wild tamarind. So those are some of our soft scale insects that we might be running into that can be pretty devastating out there on landscapes. We noted also things like aphids. Aphids also feed in that vascular bundle and will create similar um, symptoms as far as, or I guess in this case here, signs is the honeydew would be the sign of the insect, create similar uh, damage with the sucking of the plant, honeydew, and then sooty mold growing on that honeydew. This is an example of what those little tiny eggs look like. These mass produce. Um, so in some cases here, they are born pregnant and give birth to live young, which is just wild to think about. And not only do they create a lot of sooty mold and honeydew uh, or vice versa, is they can also create plant distortion. The feeding can create that plant distortion. So you see that kind of crinkling of leaves often as well. The other piercing and sucking insect that we deal with here are white fly. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this here. They get their name because the adults appear as white flies, even though they are not flies. Again, they are a piercing and sucking insect. They are in that family. Um, similar to um, scale insects, they have a form of their life phase, that nymphal phase where they actually settle down, they lose their legs and their antenna, and they just sit there as kind of like these gooey blobs that just suck from the plant. Uh, and some species will create this nice waxy filament. And in severe infestations, this is an example of ficus white fly that they can completely defoliate some of these plants. Uh, and again, repeated defoliation can be very detrimental lead to other diseases and pests coming in and eventually kill the plant. So white flies are something that are very much worth uh, treating. So then the question is, how do we treat for all these things? Well, for some of our piercing and sucking insects, we can do soil applications here. So soil applications of things like Transtec 75 WSP, which, are, which is dinotefuran, works very fast. It moves in the plant very quickly and causes mortality very quickly. Within days to a few weeks, we'll have distribution in the plant that is causing uh, mortality to those pests. We also have things like imidacloprid, our Zytec 2F. This moves a little bit slower on the plant. It can take a few weeks to months before it reaches concentrations in leaves where it's actually causing damage. Now, one thing of note is that Zytec 2F is not effective on armored scales. So Transtect is a great product because it's effective on both our soft and armored scales. So if you're not sure what you're dealing with or you're dealing with, you can have armored and soft scales on the same plant, you can use Transtech and have it be very effective. We can also do lower systemic bark sprays of these products. And even on palm trees, lower systemic bark sprays will be effective on these pests, some of the pests that Francisco will discuss here in just a little while. So again, Transtech 75 WSP, which is dinotecuran, can be mixed apply to the bark, lower bark of the plant as shown here in this video. And this can be very effective and fast. Um, in some of our research trials, we've treated over 40 plants in an hour. So we can treat a lot of pests or a lot of trees rather with this application method and be very, very effective. And then the last way we can make applications is through lower trunk injection. So doing tree injections of these products, again, with our piercing and sucking insects, notably, Transtech Infusible, which is a, a dinotefuran um, formulated as a trunk injection, or Zytec 10%, which is a midacloprid uh, formulated as a trunk injection. This is a great way to treat plants because one, it's very um, fat effective. 
and that it's going right into the tree and going up. So we don't have to worry about some of these other issues when we do systemic applications. And two is um, from the environmental sensitivity standpoint, because it's going in the plant, it's not going anywhere else in the environment. It's a great choice. And a lot of clients like this as well. And again, this can be a very fast and effective way to do these treatments. The last product that we'll talk about here is this product, Proxide. Proxide's unique in that it's an insect growth regulator. It's not a true insecticide. So what it does is it keeps the juvenile insects from maturing and it makes female insects um, from producing viable eggs. And if it comes in contact with the eggs, it can make those eggs inviable. So this is considered a reduced risk product. It does need to be sprayed versus these other products, which can be applied systemically. But if you have some clients that are looking for alternative ways outside of traditional insecticides, Proxite Insect Growth Regulator is a great application for you. We're going to breeze real quick through some of our chewing insects. So chewing insects can fall into several different categories, caterpillars, sawflies, beetles, and weevils. And these cause damage simply by chewing away plant material, as you can see here from this caterpillar just going to town on this leaf right here. A couple of insects that I like to cover over on. Um, my favorite one is a uh, Geiger tree leaf beetle, which you can find on your Geiger tree species. Um, this is both a gross and beautiful uh, pest. Both its larva and its adults cause feeding damage. Why do I say it's gross? Well, the larvae form this kind of uh, repellent goo over their bodies so that predators don't want to feed on them. And so you can see they look kind of like these slimy, gross, wormy things um, that are just kind of icky to see, right? So that's the gross phase. But the adults are quite gorgeous. They form this uh, really pretty iridescent beetle. Um, it's a beautiful thing to see. Uh, unfortunately, though, can cause some substantial damage to our, our geiger trees, uh, a chewing insect. The other chewing insects that we'll talk about here uh, briefly are our weevils. So this here is a, one of my favorite ones. This is Sri Lankan weevil, again, an imported pest. Um, but weevils cause this characteristic notching damage into leaves. And so what you see here is not like this lacing damage that causes right in the, be the interior of the leaf here. They start on the outside of the leaf, work their way in and cause that notching damage. Um, so weevils are another fun insect. Now our chewing insects open up some other products for us though. So we have things like Lepitec, which is a soil injection, which works really well on caterpillars. It's the only soil applied product that works well for caterpillars. Um, we have our trunk injected product, Mectinite, which is m mectin benzoate that works phenomenally well on our chewing insects and will give us a full season of control on our chewing insects as a trunk injection, whereas Lepitec will provide about 30 to 45 days of protection. Um, we have a trunk injected version of Lepitec, and then you can do foliar sprays of several products. A Celeprin is one that we like to recommend um, because again, it's considered a reduced risk foliar product. The last insect I'm gonna cover over on is one that doesn't really fit into those other feeding gills, are thrips. Thrips feed by um, kind of this rasping mouth part, as you can see here, it has this kind of like rasping hard, uh, kind of, it looks like a Brillo pad, maybe mouth part. And what it does is it scrapes that mouth part across the plant leaf, breaking up that plant leaf, uh, freeing up the juices in that leaf that then this insect feeds on. And this one can be a real bugger to diagnose because it mimics other issues. So here's an example of thrips damage on um, Indian hawthorn. And if I didn't know better, I would diagnose that as Entospermorium leaf spot or something else, right? So this is where diagnosis becomes really, really important. It can also create some really funky leaf distortion uh, and galling. And this is just another example of it. So thrips are another big issue that we run into a lot in Florida. Um, and we have some really good management um, practices for that. With all that, that kind of wraps up some of the common pests we find on our like trees, our traditional trees, right, and shrubs. But let's turn it over to Francisco to take us home with some of the palm protocols that we run into out there. So take it away, Francisco. Thank you, Patrick. So we are going to be uh, talking uh, about common diseases in palm in the next few minutes here. I just wanted to provide a quick reminder for those of you that uh, need to submit for CUs to uh, include in the Q&A box, uh, your certification number, name, location, uh, as requested by Patrick earlier. If you do have any questions, please submit them through the Q&A box. We will have a space at the end to answer questions. 
uh, if you're dealing with a particular disease that you would like to, uh, and you have questions on, um, please put it in there. We'd like to know what you're dealing with uh, on the landscape. All right, so the first uh, the first problem we're gonna be talking about is about our uh, friend, El Palmetto Weevil. Uh, this is uh, commonly uh, one of the hosts is uh, sable palm, uh, typically also on canary palms, and there's a very extensive list of other palms that it can be found on. Um, this affects mostly trees on the ur urban environment, but they can also be found uh, on the wild as well. Um, so just to start as far as understanding their life cycle. So mostly they start uh, as eggs once uh, they are laid by the adults, take about three to four days for them to hatch. And once they, they hatch, they start feeding uh, on, on tissue. They become a larva. There's a few stars in between. They become a, lar a larva and they start uh, feeding on around the meristem, the apical meristem of this pond. So this can take two to three months. Uh, they pupate uh, in about a week and they last uh, in that part of the life cycles and eventually they become adults. The total life cycle uh, is around 84 days for that to take place for them to become an adult from an egg. Uh, the adult could last uh, up to 26 weeks, if I'm not mistaken, on, on uh, captive uh, conditions that's uh, on the lab. So we're going to cover a few other things here. This is how um, the, the palmetto weevil can be found in different colors, like black, different shades of uh, with red. It's a beautiful insect, actually, but it causes a lot of damage, unfortunately. Uh, sizes vary as well. So the Larva is the one that causes the major damage in the palm. As you see here on this picture to the right, uh, they are actively feeding on that, uh, around that merry stem on the palm, and they have already caused a lot of damage. This is typically irreversible. So there is not, uh, there's, you can, we cannot fix the palm. Once they feed around the merry stem, uh, pretty much uh, that's the only uh, growing point that that palm has. So it will uh, eventually die. The pupa is about two plus inches in length. So it's a very large uh, uh, pupa. Uh, as you can imagine, the size of that larva is, is fairly large for what you see on the picture. So a few ways to manage uh, this insect uh, is through options through with Transtech or in either through soil injection or through injection using the infusible. Uh, version, as well as Cytec uh, 2F, which is imidacloprid, as well as uh, Cytec 10% for trunk injections. It depends on how quickly you want to get it up there into the trunk, into the canopy of the tree, so it becomes effective and controls the population of, of the insects that you're dealing with. Another uh, insect we're going to be talking about is the royal palm bug. So this is a uh, Obviously, we're going to be finding it in royal palms. Uh, it's commonly found in Cuba and in Florida in our environments. It can be also uh, uh, has not been, by literature, has not been located yet, but it can be present all the way to Mexico, Texas, Mexico. Uh, royal palm bug, uh, females deposit their eggs on, on the leaflets uh, and uh, along those emerging leaflets. So they typically lay one egg at a per day and the eggs will be hatching accordingly as well. Um, it's about one month on the life cycle. Uh, one of the few damages uh, that you can use to identify if you are having problems with royal palm bug is and for in the diagnosed process, you will notice uh, the leaflets are, uh, as they are emerging, they either have like a distortion uh, tip which could mimic like a small flag on the on the spear, uh, on the spear of the palm. Uh, also, as they start opening, you will see where they have been feeding. As you see in this picture here, the bottom part of that palm frond is uh, damaged. So once the palm fronds completely emerge, you will see all these uh, hairy-looking palm fronds that could be insightful if you are on a very high end 
uh, property that they do really care about uh, uh, aesthetics. So one distinction for this uh, problem is it's not going to kill the palm, but it's creating aesthetic issues. So potentially consistently over time, over time, it could lead with uh, uh, some decline of the palm performing, leading to nutritional deficiencies and other problems uh, and creating a major problem on the palm. Uh, the insects are very small in size, so they are, uh, as you see here on the leaflet on, on the top, they're very hard to see, even though when you are close. So I have a, a slide with a close-up uh, of how they look like. So if you see them from uh, the dorsal view, which is from the top, they are very small, but they are sort of translucent. They are in, uh, they have those uh, red eyes, but fairly translucent. But if you put them on, on the side and trying to look them from the from the lateral side uh, from the lateral view, they are pretty flat to the leaf. So they are not very uh, big at all. And this is very close. So you probably need uh, some sort of augmentation device to be able to look at them uh, at this level. A few options uh, for management is good in Florida to treat them uh, somewhere around December, January. Uh, so you catch them uh, before the new uh, leaves start emerging on the spring. So all your new canopy that is gonna be developed for the summer is freshly and clean. Uh, that's when you're gonna have the highest rate of growth and also uh, the highest uh, activity on, on the insect as it develops. A few options are Cytec, uh, which is imidacloprid, uh, or Transtec, uh, which is dinotesterone. Now we're going to be talking about lethal bronzing. So this is uh, getting a lot of attention through, through the state. Uh, there's a lot of activity with this disease. There's a large number of uh, host plants. Uh, as you can see in this picture, uh, sable palms, which is one of uh, our major uh, species in the States, as, as, along with uh, queen palm, Chinese palm palms, coconuts, Bismarck's, all those palms, pretty much every palm here is, in, is what we use in the landscape. So they are all susceptible to it. So a few, uh, a few uh, items here. So lethal bronzing is as, uh, one of the first symptoms. Uh, well, let's go back. Let's talk about lethal bronzing. Le lethal bronzing is caused by a phytoplasma that is transmitted by uh, Haplutius crudus. Uh, this is the insect that uh, actually carries the phytoplasma with him and is a uh, leaf hopper. So he's moving along on the turf and gets to these palms and and then uh, feeds on the palms and trans, uh, ad, uh, transmit the disease. So we will cover a little bit on how long it takes for that to happen towards uh, the next few slides. Um, a few of the first symptoms that you're gonna notice once you have little bronzing on your palm is uh, could be uh, your inflorescences are start uh, to uh, prematurely drop the fruit and start looking necrotic and they're gonna Loose shape, as you see here, the tips of that uh, coconut uh, inflorescence is totally damaged, uh, almost to over 50% to 60% and on in the palm. Uh, another key distinction, once you have uh, one of the first signs that you probably will see that is more common, is the discoloration of the oldest leaf. They're gonna start drying up, turning brown, and it starts from the bottom up. So that's one key distinction with this disease. So it's very important if you're starting to see these symptoms to test for um, lethal bronzing, um, submit those uh, samples to the diagnostic lab in the University of Florida here in Florida. Uh, they have a website that you can download their form and they give you really nice directions on how to submit uh, the samples. Now they're uh, showing a little more of the progress, progression of the disease. So one of the final stages is where the uh, canopy uh, and the spear starts collapsing. So as you can see here, um, you know, you are going for 
from just having palm fronds on the bottom uh, browning to create a progression to where you have pretty much the center spear leaf and the new leaves green at that point eventually all the canopy will turn brown and the whole canopy will be dead uh, you could lose the spear leaf uh, or more uh, you can actually those palm fronds eventually if they are not removed at this stage they are going to break and collapse so this is a safety hazard so it's important that as you notice that these palms start dying that you recommend to your uh, clients uh, to have this removed from the landscape for not only safety reasons but also to avoid spreading the disease and eliminate those palms from the landscape so the um, vectors don't get infected from them and start more, continue to spread the disease. So the length of time between infection and symptoms is uh, it varies. It's about four to five months. Um, so it's a it takes a little bit of time to get to where all the palm is dead. So it doesn't happen in a couple of weeks. Uh, you start seeing decline over a period of time, and it's important for keeping an eye on those symptoms so you can uh, put a plan of action, test those palms, and put treatments in place accordingly for what you would like to, to deal with. Um, it occurs in different palm species. So if you have a multiple uh, a palette of palms that is multiple on your properties, just keep an eye on all, all of them. Um, the leaf hopper takes about five days to be able to transmit the disease once it's actively feeding on, on the palm. So this has been shown on labs uh, to where they can do that. Um, they prefer shorter palms. So the younger palms have uh, you know, softer tissue and they're lower to the ground. So they can get the, up there quickly, quickly and be able to transmit that disease. So that's where they prefer to be at. So a few options um, is uh, using Cytec 10% for three injection, uh, transect infusible as well. Uh, if you are doing injections on your palms, so you could add this to your arsenal as you're uh, treating uh, the palm, and we can uh, you can reach out to us and we can look deeper into the protocol for palms. Uh, Patrick put a very nice uh, protocol for palms uh, and including this on, on the management. So. One thing to work, talk about uh, how to manage uh, this disease is, is depending on your situation. So there's, I was on the palm quest uh, a couple of weeks ago, and one of the things that uh, Dr. Bader talked about is it hasn't really been determined yet that we can manage uh, with predictable results uh, the vector. But what is important is to identify properly if we have the vector on the property uh, to be able to put a plan on action uh, on how to manage the, those palm trees. It could be that you are having palm trees that are uh, susceptible to the insect. The insect is present and you would like to target those palms uh, and treat those palms preventively with insecticides. So, uh, if they start feeding, you can control the insect. There's options where you can treat the turf surrounding, but it becomes not really practical on large amounts of turf. Uh, but uh, you can definitely look into different options on how to manage it. The, the next part we're going to be talking about is the palm belt rod. So this is uh, something that is very common in Florida. Uh, it affects a number of palms, uh, including aricas, Chinese palm palms, carpentarias, bottle palms, and it's very easy to diagnose uh, if you have it. So it starts by discoloration of the and wilting of the spear leaf. So this is very, uh, very, uh, very distinctive to this uh, disease. Uh, in many cases, this uh, you are going to be able to pull out that spear leaf out. Now I. Uh, it's not going to smell very good when you do that. So be prepared. Uh, so, but once that, that happens, 
uh, the palm is not going to be able to regenerate the leaves. Uh, eventually, that palm will be having an open canopy on the top, like you see on this picture. So there's no spear leaf uh, developing. The palm will actually survive for a long period of time once this happens. So it will continue to, to be standing. Uh, it could affect uh, any size of palms, could be on younger crops as well on the nursery level. And you see here a uh, very uh, a spear leaf that is showing signs of necrosis, uh, brown to the bottom. Uh, eventually, you are going to be able to pull out that, uh, that spear out of that center of the palm. Uh, so reminder, no new leaves will emerge from here. Uh, once that happens, eventually, we're going to lose that palm uh, down the road. So a few uh, prevent a few treatments uh, would be using like a product like Subdu Max, Reliant. Uh, uh, Reliant can be used as a soil drench. Um, Talaris is a spray. So those are options that you could use uh, to uh, limit the the progress uh, depending on the situation that you have. So we're gonna cover now. Uh, what is called a uh, false moth or graffiola leaf spot on palms. So this is uh, particularly, uh, you will find this on Phoenix palms. Uh, one palm that you can easily find it is on um, Robolinis. Um, is, uh, the initial symptoms of this is a tiny bra uh, black spot, bra sort of dark brown color uh, is one, 32 inch and less. So it's a very, very small spot. So you are going to find a number of spots through the, through the leaves. Um, the fruiting structure uh, will be black uh, on the body and it is very tiny. Uh, it's about 1 of an inch. So here we have a picture of actually it where it has developed and and it produces where it's producing those yellow uh, spores uh, that you see surrounding it. And they emerge from that black body. So also you will see those filaments uh, that are growing out that uh, look like a fruiting structure. And so they have a cup shape in the body and it looks like a small crater. Uh, if you actually look at it. So once that filament starts falling off, there's one here. It's like a small little crater of a volcano. Uh, a heavy infestation will show like, we look like these underneath the foliage. So when they are actually very active on those, on those palms. So a uh, way to control it would be with using Talaris or a product like uh, Q-Pro with foliar sprays. And one thing to distinguish on this uh, um, disease is completely cosmetic. So it's not going to create any issues as far as um, having the palm uh, uh, die out of it. So one thing, uh, one thing with, uh, with that is like uh, it grows on the older leaves. Um, you could remove those older leaves if your palm is not showing signs of uh, deficiencies at, at the nutritional level, you can remove those. But if you are having signs of uh, nutritional deficiencies, it's best to leave those palm fronts because they are still translocating nutrients to the new leaves. So as long as that palm has green on it, please, please leave it on the palm. So now we're going to cover Fusarium wilt on palms. Uh, Personally, have been dealing a lot of with this disease probably since back in 2005 or four uh, in Queen Palms, uh, particularly. But it does affect uh, Mexican palms, Canary palms as well. Um, so this is a, a vascular disease uh, in the system of the palm and affects the transportation of water in the system. So it starts from the bottom up. The, the palm fronts will start turning brown. And I have seen queen palms that are very large, gorgeous palms, a full canopy. And in a period of two weeks, they are completely brown down to the spear leaf. 
So that's uh, one distinction. It starts from the bottom up, not from the top down. Um, it's very similar to as far as Howie Browns uh, to uh, Little Bronson. Now, Little Bronson will take about five months to get to that point. Uh, this could be in a couple of weeks. So as far as management, there is uh, uh, not a cure for this uh, disease. So once uh, a palm has it, uh, best uh, method of control, it will be removing that palm immediately from the landscape uh, to uh, eliminate the, the threat in that property. Um, so one other thing as you are doing maintenance of palms, it's very important to clean your tools uh, as you progress doing the pruning. So it's very important to uh, understand how your, uh, your operations work and you're not spreading the disease. One way of you doing that is using a 25% solution of uh, household bleach or a 50% solution of rubbing alcohol. It's very easy to do, but uh, it's a practice that should be implemented uh, when pruning these palms. Now we're gonna cover nutritional deficiencies. So most of the palms at some point in their lifetime will have some sort of deficiencies. It's very important to understand how to identify these uh, uh, deficiencies and to be able to treat them accordingly. Many times you will find not only one nutritional deficiency, but you will find many of them. So nitrogen is one of our, of our nutritional deficiencies. Uh, it's light green on the oldest leaves uh, first, and only uh, the spear leaf will be green. So it's very easy to see it. Normally you will find it with others, uh, for example, potassium. Uh, a key distinction for this, this, uh, for this uh, nutritional deficiency is the uh, orange spots on the leaf throughout the whole leaf and also you will find the tips of like on this palm palm uh, of the leaves are brown. Another uh, two other nutritional deficiencies very commonly confused. Uh, so magnesium, uh, typically you will see it on, on Phoenix canaries. Uh, this is where the center of the palm front will be green and all the leaflets surrounding that rachis will be uh, uh, yellow. So like you see on that first picture, compared to manganese that actually it will develop a necrotic tissue where will create that appearance of a bristle top. And our last couple uh, nutritional deficiencies that are more common is iron which will develop chlorosis with uh, inner vein uh, uh, on the leaves uh, will still be green. So um, this is affected through many different, through either root damage or excessive uptake of nutrients. So that could be the cause of it. And boron uh, is uh, very common. You will see leaf deformation. Uh, the spur leaf will have a hard time opening up uh, when that happens. So well, thank you very much for having us. So uh, please submit your questions uh, uh, through in the Q&A box. Uh, we will be happy to take a few minutes at the end to answer those questions uh, as you submit them. A uh, few things here. Uh, please get your camera out. Take a picture of these QR codes. Uh, these are uh, free guides uh, on how to uh, uh, work with plant growth regulators in the landscape. It could be on trees or shrubs. So it's a uh, free guide uh, on how to introduce them into your operations. Also, we have uh, the scale and insect and management guide. So it will provide you a, a really good direction on how to tackle the different types of scales and how uh, to manage them in, in the landscape as well as we have the plant healthcare spring opportunities and that you can uh, of the most uh, common uh, insects that you're going to be dealing with and diseases during in the landscape for the next few months. We also uh, provide help through educational and training and support, which is what Patrick and I are dedicated to, uh, like we're doing today here. 
uh, webinars. We also uh, provide seminars. Uh, we provide CEUs and, and we also provide support, direct support to you uh, uh, with your staff in the field. Thank you very much for having us. And yes, uh, we have to, a few minutes for questions. Patrick? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Francisco. Let's see here if we have any questions in the Q&A box. So um, the first question comes in here is, is Lepitect effective against palm skeletonizer? Um, and the answer is it would be effective on palm skeletonizer. Now, keep in mind though, that that is um, with Lepitec timing is gonna be key. So Lepitec has about a 30 to 45 residual uh, in the plant. So you'll wanna time your applications right as that uh, insect is becoming active. So when you have an idea of when the insect's about to become active, you can apply Lepitec. Uh, again, it has a 30 to 45 day residual. So you can be you know, maybe a week or two ahead of when you suspect it'd be active all the way through um, it is being active. And of course, before you're seeing severe symptoms. So that would be a really good uh, application for, for that problem there. Um, another question, I think this one's going to be for you, uh, Francisco, is um, uh, Jennifer says she's seen de delay in symptoms showing if infected by September to show December for uh, um, lethal bronzing disease. So you have any comments on that one? Uh, um, I'm sure that at that point of time, there will be a, a decrease in the uh, population of the leaf hopper is not actively uh, growing at that time. Um, not sure why it is di directly uh, causing that, but it's uh, something I will intend to find more in depth um, why. But great to know that, that you're noticing that, and we can look into those uh, comments as well. Appreciate it. Another question here from Jennifer. Is OTC still recommended as a preventative for lethal bronzing uh, with an insecticide control? The answer to that is yes. Uh, it is recommended if you are, um, when do you want to start using, uh, doing treatments with OTC is when you are uh, identified uh, palms that are infected on your landscape. Now, the palms that are infected already on your landscape, you would like to have them removed, of course, but then you would like to treat the palms that have been surrounding those infected palms to uh, manage uh, the potential infestation as well as the uh, insect on, that could be attacking that palm. Excellent. Um, I have a question here. Uh, it says, Boron deficiency or abundance? Um, so I think the question is, is, we're seeing is it boron deficiencies that are causing the symptoms or are too much boron that are causing the symptoms? Yes, typically is boron deficiency. Actually, what you could actually do is treat that palm, but you could also uh, develop toxicity if you are putting uh, too much boron. So uh, one, uh, there's a couple of products you can use out there. One would be a source, a source of boron will be borax, and another one is solubor. So those are things that um, are in the market. I have used solubor in the past and borax as well. So they, but you don't want to treat the palm more than twice a year. And typically with two treatments, you will be able to rectify the problem where the palm start showing uh, signs of recovery. Once you have signs of recovery present after a year, year and a half, uh, you will be able to, uh, I would uh, suggest to discontinue treatments. Just uh, implement a good program with uh, palm fertilization, uh, with like a palm special fertilizer that includes uh, the micronutrients needed for those palms. Excellent. And just so for everyone knows, Francisco and I can stay here for a little bit longer, answer these questions. But if you do need to go, uh, please feel free to go. You will get your ISA CEU, so you don't have to stay. You, you put in your hours, so you get your CEU. But Francisco and I will stay here and answer the next uh, few questions that have come in. So thanks. Thanks, everybody. Um, so the next question is, is, how often do you recommend scouting for these diseases slash insects? 
And um, I can take a, a stab at the first part of it for sure. So your diseases, again, your diseases are going to coincide with um, mild temperatures and a lot of um, like precipitation or fog or things like that. So again, that would be typically like, you know, late fall, winter, early spring. So that's when you'd want to start scouting for your diseases to see if, um, again, those, all those aspects of the disease triangle are to come together at that time. Um, scouting for your insects, a lot of your insects, you'll see at very least the symptoms of insects um, and in many cases, the signs of insects throughout the year. So you can scout for insects um, really at any time. It's then understanding what that insect is and when is it going to be susceptible to treatment during a certain stage of its life cycle. That becomes the real trick. And that's, again, that's where if you have, a, if you've identified an insect, that's where you know, Francisco and, and myself can help with identifying when, when and what to treat with. So um, that's my answer. Anything to add, Francisco? <laughs> no, it's a proper diagnose uh, at the right time, understanding what insects uh, and diseases uh, are in every season. So not everything is present every time of the year. So the one thing to identify is what is attacking me in the summer, what is attacking me on the winter. So what I'm going to be dealing with. So once you understand that, you are going to be able to time your scouting accordingly. Uh, You're not going to be, for example, looking for a brown patch on turf uh, on the middle of the summer or on the middle of the winter. You're going to be looking for that in the transition months uh, where the temperatures start dropping uh, around 65 degrees or lower or at nights uh, or when they are coming from cold temperatures to harder temperatures on the spring. Uh, those are the two times of the year where you're going to be dealing with uh, uh, Rhizotonia solani on, or brown patch in this case. Francisco, um, the next question, I don't know the answer to, maybe you do. How long does Reliant remain in the soil for uptake? Um, I don't that, really know. Soil that I, I really don't know the answer on that. Um, I have seen it work. Uh, but uh, has seen the results within the first couple months uh, when used, uh, having had to use it again. But it is recommended to do um, a quarterly treatment. So that could help you guide guide you on as far as timeline. So I would say every three months, four months, you should be doing the treatment until you need to stop treatments accordingly. There you go. Yeah. And I'm curious now, I will look that up to see what the actual soil residual is, but you know, some of what Reliant, really what you're doing is creating this uh, systemic acquired resistance in the plant. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting to see. I don't know what the, the time it is actually available in soil for. But, um, okay. Our next question here is the best way other than foliar feeding to provide ample iron. Oh, well, the one of the best ways to provide ample iron or nutrients in this case to palm trees is to actually have a consistency on your fertilization program on the palms. Remember, deficiencies have developed due to lack of uh, consistent uh, fertilization programs uh, in the landscape, and you are dealing with a corrective situation when you actually have to supply iron. Uh, one way of doing that is doing uh, soil injections or uh, with a micronutrient package. And there is collated iron uh, in the market that you could use to do that through injections or soil drenches as well. If you're doing one or two palm trees, a soil drench will also work. Awesome, thank you. We have a few more here. So one here is, does Paclo have any positive or negative effect on palms? Do you have experience yeah. with that? <laughs> so palms? you will see, yeah, no, absolutely. So, you know, with uh, Paclo Beatrizol, uh, we know we see a host of secondary health benefits. Um, you know, namely one of the ones that we can see specifically in palm trees is we do see um, darker greener leaves with so an increased chlorophyll content. Now, as far as um, there are no negative effects that I've been privy to or experienced in my time working with Paclobutrazole or palm trees, 
Um, from a growth regulation expectation, though, you will see some growth regulation with palms, but it doesn't seem to be as significant as with things like oak trees or some of our other, um, you know, broadleaf trees. So uh, you can see for sure some darkening of the leaves. Um, we may assume that there's probably some disease resistance built into that. Um, no negative effect that I've that I've witnessed. Uh, but again, from a growth regulation standpoint, um, growth regulation is kind of over the board, and it's definitely not as again, as, uh, as good as we might say on some of our uh, broadleaf plants that are treated with plant growth regulators. And the next one here, I think this is gonna be our last one uh, is, um, and this is just a clarification, uh, was, is there any preventatives for fusarium wilt? So any fungicide preventatives for fusarium wilt? And Francis College should take that. And, as far as for fusarium wilt, there is uh, not treatment, but preventative. Uh, cleaning your tools is key uh, in between pruning palms. The uh, canary palms, for example, you want to prune that one palm, and before moving into start cutting into the next palm tree, you would like to be sanitizing those tools. So uh, queen palms are very susceptible. If you are doing that in that uh, landscape, is uh, important to do that particularly if you have already been dealing with uh, that disease on that property, is uh, very important to do so. Awesome. Well, I think that concludes all of our questions. Um, thanks, everybody that hung out uh, and stayed with us here till a few minutes past. Uh, thanks for everyone's time and attention today. If there's anything we didn't cover uh, today in the webinar, please feel free to reach out to Francisco or I. You will be uh, receiving a, um, a questionnaire or uh, a, a document to review this uh, coming soon. So please put any other questions or pests that you're dealing with in there. Uh, we'd love to learn more and we'd love to come out and meet everyone and, and help you with your plant health care programs. Um, with that, have a great rest of your uh, afternoon and week. Have a great one. Thank you all. Thank you.